from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Beautiful Spoiler Many of the stories that have from time to time been circulated with regard to the haunting of the pass of Killiecranky near Pitlochry by phantom soldiers but I do not think there is any stranger story than that told to me in my early years as a ghost hunter by a lady who testified that she had actually witnessed the phenomena. Her account of it I now give exactly in her own words. Let me commence by stating that I am not a spiritualist and that I have the greatest possible aversion to convoking the earthbound souls of the dead. Neither do I lay any claim to metamystic powers. I am, on the contrary, a plain, practical, matter-of-fact woman, and with the exception of this one occasion, have never witnessed any psychic phenomena. The incident I am about to relate took place the autumn before last. I was on a cycle tour in Scotland, and making Pitlochry my temporary headquarters, rode over one evening to view the historic pass of Killiecrankie. It was late when I arrived there, and the western sky was one great splash of crimson and gold, such vivid coloring I had never seen before. I was so entranced at the spectacle that I perched myself on a rock at the foot of one of the great cliffs that formed the walls of the pass, and throwing my head back imagined myself in fairyland. I paid no heed to the time, nor did I think of stirring until the first dark shadows of the night fell across my face. I then started up in a panic and was about to pedal off in great haste when a strange notion suddenly seized me. I had a latch key, plenty of sandwiches and a warm cape. So why should I not camp out there till early morning? I had long yearned to spend the night in the open. Now was my opportunity. The idea no sooner came to me than I put it into operation. Selecting the most comfortable looking boulder I could see, I scrambled onto the top of it and with my cloak drawn tightly over my back and shoulders settled to the night. The cold mountain air, sweet with the perfume of gorse and heather, intoxicated me and I gradually sank into a dreamy sleep from which I was abruptly aroused by a dull boom that sounded like distant musketry. I glanced at my wristwatch and saw that it was two o'clock in the morning. A nervous dread now laid hold of me, and a thousand and one vague fancies, all the more distressing because of their vagueness, oppressed and disconcerted me. I became keenly aware of the extraordinary solitude, which seemed to belong to a period far other than the present, and as I glanced around at the solitary pines and gleaming boulders, I more than half expected to see the wild, ferocious face of some robber chief, some fierce yet fascinating hero of Sir Walter Scott's, peering at me from behind them. This feeling at length became so acute that in a panic of ridiculous fear, I forcibly withdrew my gaze and concentrated it abstractly on the ground at my feet. I then listened, and in the rustling of a leaf, the humming of some night insect, the whispering of the wind as it moaned softly past me, I fancied. No, I felt sure I detected something that was not ordinary. I blew my nose and had barely ceased marveling at the loud echoes it caused before the piercing shriek of an owl made me jump a mile. I laughed with relief, but then my blood froze as I heard a course of what I tried to persuade myself could only be echoes proceed from every crag and rock in the valley. For some seconds after this I sat still, hardly daring to breathe and pretending to be extremely angry with myself for being such a fool, 
With great effort, I turned my attention to the most material of things. One of the skirt buttons on my hip, they were much in vogue then. Being loose, I endeavored to occupy myself in tightening it. And when I could no longer derive any employment from that, I set to work on my shoes and tied knots in the laces, merely to enjoy the task of untying them. But this too, ceasing at last to attract me, I was desperately racking my mind for some other device when there came again the queer booming noise I had heard before, but which I could now no longer doubt was the report of firearms. I looked in the direction of the sound, and my heart almost stopped. Racing towards me, as if not merely for his life, but his soul, came the figure of a Highlander. The wind, rustling through his long, disheveled hair, blew it completely over his forehead, narrowly missing his eyes, which were fixed ahead of him in an agonized stare. He had not a vestige of color, and the color of the moonbeams, his skin shot and livid. He ran with huge bounds, and what added to my terror, and made me doubly aware he was nothing mortal, was that each time his feet struck the hard, smooth road, upon which I could well see there was no sign of stone, there came the unmistakable sound of gravel. On he came, his bare, sweating elbows pressed into his panting sides, his great, dirty, coarse, hairy fist screwed up in bony bunches in front of him, the foam flakes thick on his clenched, grinning lips, the blood drops oozing down his sweating thighs. It was all real, horribly real, even to the most minute details. The flying up and down of his kilt, sporan and swordless scabbard, the bursting of the seam of his coat near the shoulder, and the absence of one of his clumsy shoe buckles. I tried hard to shut my eyes, but was compelled to keep them open and follow his every movement. As darting past me, he left the roadway and leaping several of the smaller obstacles that barred his way, finally disappeared behind some of the bigger boulders. I then heard the loud rat-tat of drums, accompanied by the shrill voices of fifes and flutes, and at the farther end of the pass, their arms glittering brightly in the silvery moonbeams, appeared a regiment of scarlet-coated soldiers. At the head rode a mounted officer. After him came the band, and then four abreast, a long line of warriors. In their center were two ensigns, and on their flanks officers and non-commissioned officers with swords and pikes, more mounted men bringing up the rear. On they came, the fipes and flutes, ringing out with the weird clearness and the hushed mountain air. I could hear the ground vibrate, the gravel crunch and scatter as they steadily and mechanically advanced. Tall men, enormously tall men, with set white faces and pale flashing eyes. Every instant I expected they would see me, and I became sick with terror at the thought of being the target of those eyes. But from this I was happily saved, for no one appeared to notice me, and they all passed by without much as a twist or turn of the head, their feet keeping time to one everlasting and monotonous tramp, tramp, tramp. I got down and watched until the last of them had turned a bend of the pass, and the gleam of his weapons and trappings could no longer be seen. Then I remounted my boulder and wondered if anything further would happen. It was now half past two and blended with the moonbeams was a peculiar whiteness, which rendered the whole aspect of my surroundings dreary and ghostly. Feeling cold and hungry, I set to work on my beef sandwiches, and was religiously separating the fat from the lean, for I am one of those foolish people who detest fat, when a loud rustling made me look up. Confronting me on the opposite side of the road was an ash tree, and to my surprise, despite the fact that the breeze had fallen and there was scarcely a breath of wind, the tree swayed violently to and fro while there proceeded from it the most dreadful moanings and groanings. I was so terrified that I scrambled down from my bicycle and tried to mount, but I was obliged to desist as I had not a particle of strength in my limbs. Then to assure myself the moving of the tree was not an illusion, I rubbed my eyes, pinched myself, and called aloud, but it made no difference. The rustling, bending and tossing still continued. 
Summoning up courage, I stepped into the road to get a closer view. When, to my horror, my feet kicked against something, and on looking down, I saw the body of an English soldier with a ghastly wound in his chest. I gazed around, and there, on all sides of me, from one end of the valley to the other, lay dozens of bodies of horses and men, Highlanders and English, white cheeked, lurid eyed, and bloody browed. Here was the writhing, wriggling figure of an officer, with half his face shot away, and there, a horse with no head. And there, but I cannot dwell on such horrors, the very memory of which makes me feel sick and faint. The air, that beautiful fresh mountain air, resounded with their moanings and groanings and reeked with the smell of their blood. As I stood rooted to the ground with horror, not knowing which way to look or turn, I suddenly saw drop from the ash tree the form of a woman, a highland girl, with bold features, raven black hair, and the widest of arms and feet. In one hand she carried a wicker basket, in the other a broad-bladed, horn-handled knife. A gleam of avarice and cruelty came into her large, dark eyes. As wandering around her, they rested on the rich facings of the English officers' uniforms. I knew what was in her mind, and forgetting she was but a ghost, that they were all ghosts. I moved heaven and earth to stop her, but I could not. Making straight for a wounded officer who lay moaning pitilessly on the ground, some ten feet away from me, she spurned with her slender, graceful feet the bodies of the dead and dying English that came in her way. Then, snatching the officer's sword and pistol from him, she knelt down and calmly plunged her knife into his heart, working the blade backwards and forwards to assure herself she had made a thorough job of it. Anything more hellish I could not have imagined, and yet it fascinated me. The girl was so fair, so wickedly fair and shapely. Her act of cruelty over, she spoiled her victim of his rings, epaulets, buttons, and gold lacings, and having placed them in her basket, proceeded elsewhere. In some cases, unable to remove the rings easily, she chopped off the fingers and dropped them just as they were into her basket. Neither was her mode of dispatch always the same, for while she put some men out of their misery in the manner I have described, she cut the throats of others with as great as nonchalance if she had been killing fowls, while others again she settled with the butt ends of their guns or pistols. In all she murdered a full half score, and was decamping with her booty when her gloating eyes suddenly encountered mine, and with a shrill scream of rage she rushed towards me. I was an easy victim, for strained and pray how I would, I could not move an inch. Raising her flashing blade high over her head, an expression of fiendish glee in her staring eyes she made ready to strike me. This was the climax. My overstrained nerves could stand no more, and before the blow had time to descend, I pitched heavily forward and fell at her feet. When I recovered, every phantom had vanished, and the pass glowed with all the cheerful freshness of the early morning sun. I cycled very hurriedly home, none the worse physically for my adventure, but resolved never again to spend another night in the open alone. The Hand of Promise Harmful and vindictive ghosts are, thank goodness, not in the majority, though they do become active. They can cause untold distress. A decidedly harmful ghost is the ghost that tempts one to vice. A house in Chelsea was long haunted by a ghost of this kind, and from accounts given me of the haunting by a tenant who experienced it, I am able to construct the following case. A nonconformist minister, the Reverend J.P. Hackett, went to look over the house when it was up to let. He did not go alone, but it was accompanied by a boy from the estate agent's office and it was just about midday when they arrived there. After inspecting the basement and ground floor, Mr. Hackett left the boy in the hall and ascended the stairs. Arriving on the first floor, he was about to cross the landing to one of the front rooms when he heard a noise like the click of a door handle, and turning sharply round, saw the door of a room overlooking the black premises suddenly begin to open. 
when it had opened slowly a few inches, a hand, thrust cautiously through the aperture, clutched hold of the door and held it stationary. Though he could see no one, Mr. Hackett now became conscious that someone was closely scrutinizing him. The landing window faced due south and the sunlight pouring in through the hand into very strong relief. It was obviously a woman's hand and just as obviously its owner was a woman of refinement for the fingers were white and tapering and the nails highly polished. Mr. Hackett was fascinated. He had never seen such beauty in a hand before and found it quite impossible to remove his gaze from it. He was trying to force himself to do so when there was a whiff of delicate perfume and the hand withdrew while the door immediately afterwards closed noiselessly. Mr. Hackett, supposing the lady to be someone who, like himself, was looking over the house with a view to taking it, but who for some reason did not wish to be seen, thought no more of the matter till he had finished his inspection of the premises and had rejoined the boy in the hall. He then casually remarked that there was a lady upstairs, presumably on the same errand as himself, unless she happened to be the owner of the property. To his surprise, the boy did not answer at once, but looking very much alarmed, said after some hesitation, The owner of the house is a gentleman, sir. He's a widower. Besides, he's abroad just now, and no one but yourself has had the keys today. Mr. Hackett suggested to the boy that he should go and see who the other person was, but as the boy appeared extremely reluctant to do so, the minister told him to come along and they climbed the stairs together. On arriving at the room in question, the door of which was still shut, Mr. Hackett paused and listened for a moment outside. He could hear nothing, however, and when he threw the door open and peered in, he could see no one. She must be somewhere else in the house, Mr. Hackett said, and at once proceeded to look, but though he searched everywhere in the building, he could find no sign of anyone. The mysterious woman had vanished as wholly and completely as if the ground had suddenly opened and engulfed her. It's strange, said the minister. There was certainly someone in that room, and I can't imagine how they could have got out of the house with our seeing in them. There's no back entrance, is there? Only in the basement, sir, the boy replied, and no one has gone down there. That night, when he got home, Mr. Hackett tried to settle down as usual after dinner to write or read, but he could not. A strange restlessness was on him. At last, he gave up trying and went to bed. He slept and in his dreams saw once again the delicately molded hand and inhaled again the fragile perfume. He took the house, and within a week, he and his family were settled in. Then their troubles began. A few days after their arrival, his wife came to him one morning, very agitated. Mary's drunk, she said. Mary was the general. Nonsense, said Mr. Hackett, looking up from his work in astonishment. It's true, his wife said despairingly. When I went into the kitchen just now to see her about lunch, she burst out laughing and began talking a lot of rubbish. She simply reeked of spirits. And up to now, she has been such a pattern, Mr. Hackett said. Well, she will have to go, that's all. I have given her notice, said his wife. There was nothing else to be done. Do you think there is anything wrong with this house? What do you mean, wrong? I don't know, his wife replied, but I get impressions. I constantly feel that I am being watched, and this morning after breakfast, I had a very odd experience. I was in our bedroom making the bed when someone knocked at the door. Thinking it was Mary, that was before I found her drunk, I called, come in, and the door once opened and someone crossed the room. I heard footsteps most distinctly. They passed close behind me, yet when I turned around to see who it was, there was no one there. Do you think the house is haunted? Haunted, said the minister. Why, my dear, there are no such things as ghosts. You may rest assured it was fancy, sheer fancy. Your nerves are overwrought. 
You may think so, his wife answered, but you will change your mind if you see or hear something yourself. Mr. Hackett made no reply. He was convinced that he had seen something already, and despite himself, he kept wishing that he could see it again, and soon. A day or two after this incident, he came home one evening after holding a service some distance away, feeling more than unusually tired and exhausted. His wife and children happened to be out, and there was apparently no one in the house but himself. Sitting on a chair in the hall, he was about to take off his boots, a thing he would not have done had his wife been at home, as he knew she objected to it, when he heard footsteps ascending the stone stairs leading from the basement. They were light steps, accompanied by the tapping of high heels. Up and up they came till they arrived in the hall, where they halted for a moment, and then began to approach him. There was still a certain amount of daylight, enough at all events for him to see any tolerably large object in the hall, but though he stared hard in the direction of the sounds, he could see nothing to account for them. Yet nearer and nearer came the tapping, and then suddenly there was a whiff of scent, which Mr. Hackett recognized at once. It seemed to arouse within him passions and cravings he had never in his life been conscious of before. He was thrilled right through and more than intoxicated. The tapping came right up to him and as it passed him by, it seemed that cool, soft fingers touched him lightly on the forehead, while he felt the clinging folds of a dress pass gently over his feet. Then all had swept on and left him, and he heard the front door open and close again, after which the air around him suddenly became so cold and chill that his teeth chattered, and he was seized with a violent fit of shivering. A wild desire to follow the thing now took possession of him, and springing up from his chair, he rushed out of the house into the darkening street. There was nothing there save the rows of tall, gently nodding trees and gleaming lampposts. Convinced, however, that he would find it again, somewhere he walked on, and leaving the quiet by-roads in which he lived, plunged into the glare and noise of the King's Road. He walked until forced to look around for somewhere to rest. Right at his elbow was a public house with the word lounge written invitingly in huge lettering in one of its windows. There was no other refreshment place open within sight. Mr. Hackett considered the matter. He had the usual nonconformist antipathy to public houses, but it was a question of expedience. He must sit down somewhere and there was nowhere else for him to go. He approached the place cautiously and opening a door was peeping inside when mingled with the odors of beer and tobacco came a whiff of something else. It was scent, and fancying in his overwrought state that it clearly resembled the scent he had been following with such persistence, he gave vent to something approaching a moan and rushed inside. An hour or so afterwards, he staggered out onto the pavement at least three quarters drunk. That was the beginning of it. When he arrived home late, his wife was sitting up for him, and there was a harrowing scene. She was at first too amazed and dumbfounded to say anything. Her husband drunk? It was impossible. She could only sit and gaze at him in stupefied silence, and then, as the truth slowly forced itself upon her, she burst out weeping and flew upstairs to bed. She fell asleep sooner than one would have thought it possible after such a shock, but her dreams were not marish, and she awoke with a start to hear the clock in the hall striking two. Directly afterwards, she heard her door open slowly and someone steal softly into the room. With all her faculties painfully on the alert, she at once sat up and looked. There was just enough light from the moon to make certain near objects dimly visible. At first, she could see nothing strange. Then suddenly out of the blackness came a hand, which she saw the start was not the hand of her husband, nor of anyone in the house. It was absolutely white and slender, the fingers tapering the nails exquisitely shaped. She could see nothing beyond the wrist. It came nearer and nearer to her, gropingly as if someone were feeling their way. And finally it rested on her forehead. Only, however, for one brief second, 
It was then withdrawn, while immediately afterwards, Mrs. Hackett again heard footsteps, this time retreating in the direction of the door, which opened gently and closed again. Then all was silent. Somehow Mrs. Hackett was not frightened. On the contrary, she said afterwards, she felt too irritated at being so disturbed to think of going to sleep again. She blamed her husband and attributed it all to him. Had he not come home so late and in that disgraceful condition, she felt the strange incident could not have happened. How drink degraded a man. In her mind, she again went through her husband's homecoming and saw him staggering in through the doorway and falling in helpless fashion into a chair. How he had reeked of whiskey and what a dreadfully lost expression there had been on his face. The more Mrs. Hackett pondered over her husband's conduct, the more the situation magnified itself until she finally resolved to leave him altogether and return to her parents. With this end in view, she immediately dressed, packed some things into a couple of small cases, and as soon as it was daylight, stole downstairs into the street and hailed a passing taxi. She never returned to the house. When Mr. Hackett realized what had happened, he was stunned that his wife should desert him just at a time when he needed her love and sympathy most seemed quite incredible, and he felt crushed. Then suddenly in the midst of his trouble there came to him a memory of that scent and the exquisite hand, and he actually found himself reveling his own word and the prospect of being in the house practically alone with them. His two young children, a boy and a girl, did not appear to take their mother's desertion to heart nearly as much as he might have been expected, but then the house had wrought a most marked change in them as well. Up to the time of their coming to it, they had been as near models of obedience as children can be, but now it was the reverse. Hardly a day passed when they did not quarrel violently and they were most rude and obstructive to their daily governess. But that was not the worst. The girl showed a new and shocking trait in her character. The governess one morning found her deriving the greatest amusement from torturing flies, and a day or two later the girl was discovered in the act, assisted by her brother, of inflicting abominable cruelties on a mouse that had been caught alive in a trap. The governess was so disgusted that she left the house at once and the children, having no one to control them any longer, did more or less as they liked. One night, however, they too received a shock. They both slept in the nursery and after having been asleep for some time, the girl Emma was awakened by hearing someone moving about in the room. Thinking it was her brother John, she called out to him to be quiet and on his taking no notice, she immediately sat up to her surprise, instead of seeing John, she saw standing in the center of the room in a flood of moonlight, a tallish figure enveloped from head to foot in a long black cloak. The figure remained motionless for some seconds and then, crossing the floor with a curious gliding movement, advanced towards the door, Emma watching it in breathless expectation. On its reaching the doorway, which was parallel with her bed, the figure turned round and beckoned to Emma, and the girl noticed its beautiful white hands. Wondering who it could be, she awakened John and the two children, slipping out of bed, followed after the cloaked figure. Leading them across the landing, it descended two flights of stairs to the first story, and then, making direct for their father's door, came to a halt immediately outside. More than ever puzzled, the children were about to call out to their father when the figure slowly turned round and confronted them. It remained thus quite still for a few seconds, and then suddenly throwing aside the cloak, which had up to the present concealed its face, it stood fully revealed before them. To their great horror, it was nothing human. The body, beautifully formed, resembled that of a woman, but the face was that of some very grotesque and repulsive animal. In the place of human cheeks were huge collops of white, unwholesome fat. The nose was snout-like, the mouth a great slit, and the whole conformity of the features suggested the distorted face of a pig, which appeared all the more macabre by reasons of the figure's hair, unmistakably a woman's, 
which fell in a bright gold mass around the neck and shoulders. The children were still staring at the apparition in speechless horror when their father opened the door of his room, and as he did so the figure slowly faded away, though not before he had caught a full view of it. Mr. Hackett and his children left the house the following day, and it is pleasant to note that not long after they had been living in a new atmosphere, their life settled back to normal, and a reconciliation between the reverend gentleman and his wife quickly took place. Many and various tenants in succession occupied the house in Chelsea after the Hackett's, and from my further investigations, made as late in the 1940s, there was good reason to believe the house was badly haunted. A dozen explanations have been offered for the strange haunting. A popular theory is that the pig-faced apparition is the earthbound spirit of some peculiarly vicious and degenerate woman who, having lived and died in the house, is bound to it by her earthly desires and passions. Personally, I think differently. I believe the haunting springs were events which occurred on the site before the house was built, involving, as it seems, to do a harmful spirit of the elemental kind, which never knew human form, and so was unable to manifest itself completely in the skies. The elemental type of ghost is by no means uncommon. The reader will recall that such an apparition was the first I ever saw.